Um, I just want to welcome uh, those of you that are visiting for the first time. Don't laugh at me, Greg. Um, if you, I haven't met you yet, I'm Pastor Teresa. I co-pastor this campus with my husband, Pastor Glenn. And today I have the awesome honor and privilege of getting to conclude our EQ series. Turn to your neighbor and say, Emotional Quotient. And we have been learning about how important EQ is. Most of the time we listen and we hear about people always talking about IQ and there's a lot of not so friendly jokes about IQ. But we um, as a church believe that your EQ, your emotional quotient is just as important, if not more important than your IQ. Can I get an amen? And so I hope that you've been tracking with us these four weeks and that you enjoy it. Today's message to conclude the entire series is called Sleep Deprived. Turn to your neighbor and say, are you sleep deprived? <laughs> turn, <laughs> turn to your other neighbor and say, I don't know, but you kind of look a little sleepy. <laughs> All I know, you can move. You can sit with your family. <laughs> Hallelujah. This is Aldera's mom. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm glad you folks made it. Um, I don't know about you all, but sleep is a major topic for me in this stage of my life. And for those of you who know that I had a newborn about 16 months ago. Uh, his name is Emmett. And um, it never seems to fail that all of my children God blesses me with are night children. So not, not any of them slept through the night. So I'm so jealous of those parents like Aldera who has a baby that like, oh yeah, she sleeps like through the night and if I don't wake her up, she won't wake up. I'm like, what? Lord, <laughs> you could, out of all five, you couldn't give me one. No, uh, Emmett is a ball of energy and he still wakes up in the middle of the night and he still wants to be up till like 10 in the evening, 11 o'clock sometimes on a bad day when he takes his nap late, he'll be up till midnight. I'm like, I can't do it. One of you kids got to watch him. I'm too old for this. Um, and then he'll still get up at six o'clock in the morning, seven o'clock in the morning. I mean, so sleep is a valuable commodity in my life right now. And so, yeah, I, I feel a little sleep deprived, small kind. So if you catch me and I'm kind of spacing out, it's just my brain is probably sleeping. You might be talking to me and I'm looking at you, but I don't know if the ticker is going because uh, it might be sleeping. So just umbrella of grace. And um, you guys giggle about, you know, being sleepy, but raise your hand if you feel sleepy more times than not. It's terrible how us Americans are. We work so hard and it's because we have to work that hard to make a living, especially in Hawaii. Can I get an amen? Um, so you work, 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 work to make this living so that you can live in a place called paradise, and yet you're too sleepy to enjoy the place that we call paradise. Hallelujah. If you ask me to go to the beach, I'm just like, nah, I don't like go. But you can take Emmett with you. Take the whole family and go to the beach. <laughs> I'll just stay home and, like, sleep um, because it, it's difficult. And this morning, we're going to talk about how important it is for us not to be sleep deprived. Turn to your neighbor and just let them know. Just say, God does not intend for you to be sleepy. <laughs> Turn to your other neighbor and say, God wants you to find rest. And so our thesis, if you will, our main scripture for today is going to come up on the screen. It's in Matthew chapter 11. Verses 28 through 29, and many of you have heard this, but let's read it together. Ready? And go. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So this is Jesus, and this is what he's telling the people. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened. Raise your hand if you ever felt weary. Raise your hand if you're feeling weary right now. Hallelujah. Raise your hand if you've ever felt burdened. Okay? Um, the promise that we have in Jesus is if we come to him, we'll find rest. And I don't want to get ahead of myself. We're going to come back to that scripture at the end. But I'm going to jump right on in and say to find rest in a full life. Say full life. We all have a full life. So to find rest in a full life, we need to remember to, number one, write in your notes, observe the Sabbath rest. 
observe the Sabbath rest. Now, where does the Sabbath rest come from? Where does that terminology come from? It, it's found based off of Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 through 3, and that's in your notes. And it says, by the seventh day, God had finished. Turn to your neighbor and say, God had finished. God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. So what's going on here? Basically, in six days, God created all of the heavens and the earth, all of the birds, all of the oceans and the sea. He created all of the world in which we live today. Six days, he created that, okay? On the seventh day, he rested. Now, why did God rest after he had worked for six days? Was it because he needed to rest? No. God doesn't need to rest. Hallelujah. Sometimes I wish I could be God, but then I think to myself, Teresa, you don't want to be God. Better to be human and need rest. Right? But God didn't, he didn't need rest, but he rested anyways. So why did he do that? Well, it's because he wanted to establish for his people the foundation for their worship life, how they were to worship God. He was to establish for his people the significance of what it meant for them as his people to need to rest. Because remember, he created humanity. He knows our limitation. He created us. And he knew from the very beginning, my people are going to need to learn how to rest. Right? Amen? And the word holy is significant. The word holy basically means set apart, okay? It's all, that's all that means is set apart. So God is saying that on the seventh day when you rest, that is a day that you're supposed to set apart. Now, the, import, the importance of the Sabbath rest is are you supposed to set this day apart so that you can just live for you? Is that what the Sabbath rest is? Are we supposed to set the day apart so that we can do whatever fills our cup? No. The Sabbath rest was designed for you to set that day apart, for you to stop doing all of your labor and all of your work so that you can come into the presence of Almighty God and know that he is your source of all things, that it's not your labor that sustains you. It is God Almighty that's going to sustain you. So this was the foundation of the Hebrew people that they were to set this day apart to come unto God and worship him, okay? Later on, I'm going to show you how we can get very legalistic about that, which is why Jesus himself had to establish a new rest. Can I get an amen, okay? If God himself is showing us our need for rest, then it would stand to reason that we should honor and know that we need to rest. Amen? And before I go any further, I want to give you another example of a person who rested. And this person is more like you and I. His name is Elijah. Turn to your neighbor and say, Elijah is like us. Now, Elijah was a prophet. And if you have your Bibles, it's not in your notes. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. It's 1 Kings chapter 19. If you have one of those fancy smartphones, you can pull it up too. Okay, 1 Kings chapter 19. Now, Elijah was like us. I'm not making that up. In James chapter 17, it describes Elijah like us. He's just like you and I as a human. Um, and his story is found in scriptures doesn't mean that just because his story is in the Bible doesn't mean that he had it all together, okay? What I love about the Bible is it shows you and I, ordinary people like you and I, that have issues. They have stuff, okay? And... Um, just like you and I, Elijah goes through this time, and I'm going to explain the story to you, where he has a range of emotions from the thrill of victory to the depths of despair. Okay, how many of you have ever felt like the, you're like totally victorious, you're on, you're on top of the mountain, everything's going right for you? And then how many of you have felt that feeling where like, can anything go right in this world? <laughs> Just kill me now. Okay, so Elijah, Elijah's had those emotions too. 
He's been like, yeah, I'm the king of the mountain. And then, oh, can I just roll over and die under this bush in this tree? Right? And you're thinking, okay, he's a prophet. And what's interesting about Elijah's story is he hits his wall in the depths of his despair after a major um, victory. So it's important for you and I to realize that sometimes emotionally, we can hit our rock bottom moments right after we've had a major success. Right? And in all honesty, I think more times than not, that's when it comes. I think your, your woes and your sorrows and your, your pressure and your heartache always tends to seem to find you after you've experienced some great victory or success. And, and you know, I think the reason why is because when you're doing God's work and you're experiencing a major victory, the enemy can't come at you. You're in the midst of doing God's work. But when you rest later, that's when you're like, guard is down, the enemy can come and attack. For us pastors, we used to call that Monday blues. You spend the entire weekend serving God, and you see victory after victory, breakthrough after breakthrough, and then Monday morning you wake up and you're like, why do I feel like I've just been crushed with a big boulder? And I used to go and talk to Pastor Mike about that. I'm like, why do I feel depressed every Monday? Like, this is not good. Do I need to see a therapist? I'm like, I'm not kidding. I was like, should I go see a therapist? Like, really, every Monday morning, Pastor Mike, I'm feeling depressed. I'm feeling discouraged. And he's like, oh, you've just been slimed. That's all that is. The enemy can't slime you on Sunday, so he waits on Monday, and then he gets you when you're at home, and you're like, got your guard down, and you're resting, because Monday officially is our day off, right? And then I had to learn how to overcome that. Because now that my mind was alert to it, I'm like, okay, wait, the enemy is lurking when I'm tired, right? And that's my biggest point I want you guys to realize, that when you're tired from whatever it is, long hours, not getting enough sleep, just total emotional spending for a good thing, you know, like did two-hour worship concert, you went and did the Hands of Hope, and you fed the homeless, you did all this stuff, and you're physically just depleted, emotionally, spiritually. You're just done. That's when the enemy is going to try and pounce on you. And Elijah went through the same thing, okay? Basically, he had to take on Ahab, who was described as the king who irritated and upset the Lord more than any other king. He was like the worst king ever to really provoke and make God angry. And if that wasn't enough, Ahab had his queen partner, and her name they called was Jezebel. And Jezebel was actually the, the brains behind the twosome. She was the one who was kind of controlling Ahab. And basically what happened was Elijah takes on Ahab, this Jezebel, and 450 prophets of Baal. He took them all on. And he basically stood for God, the one true God. He said, no, my God is greater than your God. And alone, Elijah takes on this. It was the most epic battle ever. And I can't get into that part of the story. But if you want to read it, that's before 1 Kings chapter 19. So right now, we're going to enter in at 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1. And this is when the battle is all said and done. Okay? And Elijah experienced great victory. He won this battle with the power of Almighty God. And in verse 1, it says, when Ahab got home and he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, okay? He goes home and he tells a Jezebel, oh, look, we completely got destroyed. Elijah wiped us out, okay? Including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. This is what Jezebel said. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the God strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. So Ahab and Jezebel are now after Elijah, okay? He just won this fierce battle. He was victorious, and now he, he hears about how they're coming after him. And Elijah was afraid and fled, fled for his life, okay? It says he went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die, Okay, he traveled all day, he sat down under a tree, and he said, oh, can I just die already? He was so depleted, he was so discouraged, he was so depressed, he was just had it. 
You know, if you ever had that moment and you just had it, okay? We, we, if you haven't had that moment, praise God. But for those of us that have had that moment, it is an ugly moment. Where you just sit down under the tree, you're just like, just kill me already. I just want to go home and be with Jesus. <laughs> it's just done already. Well, here's Elijah under the tree, and he's saying this. Oh, that I might die. Okay? He says, I have had enough, Lord. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. So you can see where, where Elijah is at in the darkest moment he probably ever had. In verse 5, it says, then he lay down and he slept under the broom tree. Okay? He was so exhausted, he just laid down and he fell asleep. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around, and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. How's that for supernatural provision? And maybe that's the message for somebody here today. God knows what you need. He can supernaturally give it to you. Do you have the faith to believe it? Elijah just went to sleep. He didn't even ask for it. He fell asleep under the tree. He, what he asked for was God to kill him. Thank the Lord that he doesn't always give us what we ask for. Can I get an amen? That's a great lesson right there from Elijah. Elijah thought what he needed was to just die. Kill me already, Lord. I'm praying, Lord, just take me. That was his prayer. How many times have you and I prayed for something that that's not what we needed? That ain't even what was God's best for us. Thank you, Jesus, that you are more sovereign and you know our needs more than we know our needs and you don't give us sometimes what we ask for. Hallelujah. And thank you, Lord, that you didn't give Elijah that. What did God give him instead? God sent an angel to give him food and water. And the angel tells Elijah in his sleep, he's sleeping. He says, get up, get up. He looked around, and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank, and he laid down again. What happened? He fell asleep. The angel of the Lord gave him bread and water. He woke up because the angel of the Lord said to wake up. He ate some bread. He drank some water. And then what did he do again? He went back to sleep. How many of you need that day? <laughs> You need to go to sleep, you need to wake up, eat some breakfast, and you need to crawl back in the bed and go to sleep some more. Okay? <laughs> so if you ever had that day, don't feel guilty. Don't feel guilty. Maybe the Lord knew you needed that, and he gave it to you. Okay, it ain't over. Then it said he went to sleep again, and then the angel of the Lord, verse 7, came again, and he touched him, and he said, get up and eat some more, or the journey ahead will be too much for you. So he went to sleep, the angel woke him up, he ate, he went back to sleep. The angel woke him up again, and the angel said, eat some more. <laughs> oh, how many of us are thinking, can somebody please tell me that? <laughs> no, what we get told is don't eat that. that. A moment on the lips is a lifetime on the hips. I'm just like, come on now. The Lord told Elijah to go and eat some food. <laughs> Don't justify it. <laughs> I know you're thinking that. Oh, well, pastor said that the Lord said you should eat. So I'm going to go get me some matzo moto to shave ice after today. <laughs> but what is that to tell you? What is God trying to show us here? Number one, that he's too good. He's not going to give us what we think we need. He's going to give us what we really need. And sometimes all we really need is to sleep and to eat. Because he knows that we're depleted. We are human. God didn't need to rest, but he established the Sabbath rest because he knew we would need to. Amen? And so many times we don't honor the Sabbath rest. So many times we don't keep this day set apart as holy unto the Lord. So many times we think that, oh, I can just do an extra shift and work overtime. And, and for those of you that have no choice, you have to work on Sunday, that's okay. God knows. And the good news is coming in the next couple of points, okay? Because the Sabbath rest was designed for the Jew. Turn to, the neighbor, turn to your neighbor and say, the Sabbath rest was designed for the Jews. Regardless of who God designed it for, you and I are Gentiles, okay? Regardless for who he designed it for, 
the point that we learn from Elijah, who is just like you and I, and you can write this in your notes, is physical rest is required for emotional health. Physical rest is required for emotional health. And sometimes maybe the holiest, most spiritual thing you can do is to sleep and go eat and go sleep some more and go eat some more. Because your body is hammered, especially if you're emotionally and spiritually and physically serving in God's kingdom. And I know many of you are. You, your service unto the Lord is not just reserved for Sunday. If you are a true disciple of God, at any moment, God can say, go, and you go. Can I get an amen? There are times that we'll go minister to a family on a Wednesday night and, like, be up till, like, 10 or 11 o'clock at night after working a full day. I mean, we're talking 12, 14-hour day. Tuesdays for Glenn and I, for years, 14 years of Tuesdays, used to be, like, from 8 in the morning till sometimes midnight, and we'd have a window in the afternoon that we would try to take a nap. Now we have a little more wisdom, and it's called we're a little older. So we're like, we need to kind of get out of here by this time. But when we were younger, we used to be up till midnight. And it wasn't because we were practicing worship till midnight. It's because once we were done worshiping and practicing for worship, we would minister to the people that were servants. So we would be up till midnight talking to them and discipling them and walking through life with them. And on those kind of days, you get emotionally completely drained. And if you don't find the times of rest, you're going to burn out. You will not go the distance in serving the kingdom of God. There is a rhythm that we have to learn of work, rest, work, rest, work, rest. Sometimes it's work, 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 rest, 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 rest. It, there's not any one particular pattern that's right. The most important pattern that you just know is there's got to be rest in the pattern somewhere. Can I get an amen? I can't tell you how many times I've seen believers burn out because they didn't rest, because they were doing a good work. Do you know that there are people who serve church on Sunday so much for so long that they burn out? I've seen whole families leave churches because they were completely emotionally spent on ministry. I've seen people that were gifted and anointed to do children's ministry, like crazy kind of gifting to do children's ministry, but because they never had a break, they can't even go into a children's ministry room anymore. They have to completely do something else. That is not God's design for his people. We have to learn how to rest. Now, all that to say, are we supposed to be legalistic about it? No. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't be legalistic. Turn to your other neighbor and say, don't be like the Pharisees. Okay, if you have your Bibles, you can jump over to Luke chapter 6. And we're going to start at verse 6. Okay. Actually, I'm just going to start at verse 1. And here we see Jesus. When God established the Sabbath, it was before Jesus walked the planet. Amen? Um, but when he established the Sabbath, it was to separate what was ordinary from what was holy. God's day. Okay? It was the foundation for Israel's worship, but it was also a foreshadowing or an anticipation of a coming age of rest. Turn to your neighbor and say, there is a coming age of rest. What does that mean, a coming age of rest? That means there is a season of perpetual rest. How many of you would like to live in a constant state of rest? Hallelujah. <laughs> Not to just say sleep isn't important. You still have a physical body, so sleep is still important. But there is a place of constant rest, and we're going to get to that. And when Jesus is discussing the Sabbath here, this is leading us to that end. And in verse 1, it says, On one Sabbath day, as Jesus was walking through some grain fields, his disciples broke off heads of grain, rubbed it off the husk in their hands, and ate the grain. So basically... Jesus and his peeps were walking through a field. 
they took some of the grain and they ate them. Okay? Then the Pharisees said, why are you breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath? Because remember, you're not supposed to work at all. You cannot labor. So just grabbing some grain is, is work to the Pharisees. Okay? Jesus replied, haven't you read in scriptures what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He went into the house of God and broke the law by eating the sacred loaves of bread that only the priests can eat. He also gave some to his companions. And Jesus added, the son of man is Lord even over the Sabbath. Now, when he said that, the son of man is Lord even over the Sabbath, there's a twofold here. The first one is to remind the Pharisees, which they had forgotten, that the real reason for the Sabbath was to benefit human beings, the man. It's not the opposite way. The Sabbath is for God's people, right? So the Sabbath shouldn't be like a, a chain choking us, that we're so rigid and so legalistic. And secondly, he's establishing that Jesus, who is the Son of Man, which is another title, the Son of Man is another title for Jesus, is the Lord over the Sabbath, which means the Sabbath belongs to Jesus, okay? Okay. Then it goes on and he gives another example of Jesus healing a man on the Sabbath. Now to heal a man on the Sabbath in the eyes of the Pharisees was doing work too. Because that's like a doctor doing medicine, practice. You're healing somebody. So you're not supposed to work. Okay? And this is what Jesus says to them. Because he knows they're making, thinking all these things. And he says, then Jesus said to his critics, I'm at verse 9. I have a question for you. Does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath? Or is it a day for doing evil? Is this a day to save life or to destroy it? And I love that Jesus asked a question. He challenged his critics by asking a question. Because to choose one of, or the other, they would have got caught in a trap. Like how can you say that the Sabbath is a day for evil? Right? Therefore, you have to choose that the Sabbath is a day for good. Therefore, you justify that him healing this man was good. I love how he cornered them into that. So all that to share with you is that, yes, the Sabbath day is a day that you should set apart and keep as holy for your time with God. But we, we don't want to be legalistic. We don't want you to feel like, oh, well, I can't go to my, I can't skip church because my mother-in-law who is bedridden needs to go to the hospital and I'm the only person who can take her to the hospital, but the Bible tells me I'm supposed to observe the Sabbath day and, you know, uh, that's, that's like working if I have to drive her to the hospital and that's kind of legalistic. What is more godly and what is more beneficial of the human being? You taking your mother to the hospital. Can I get an Amen. She's bedridden and needs to go to the hospital. So we don't want to get trapped like the Pharisees did with the Sabbath. We want to understand that the Sabbath is for you. It was supposed to be for your good. And it is designed so that you would stop your work in your labor, which is normally Monday through Friday or Monday through Saturday. Um, I know, like, for example, we have firefighters in our church. They have a rotating schedule. So some days, Sundays is a work day for them. But that's good work. You're saving lives, <laughs> right? So we don't want to be legalistic about it, but the most important part of the Sabbath is, are you resting? Are you resting and are you stopping and acknowledging that God is your sole provider? He is the one who is sufficient. He is the sustainer of your life. If you look at your life and you don't have that in there consistently, then you're never going to find the rest that your soul and your body is craving. We cannot be people that treat Sunday morning Sabbath as, well, I can take it or leave it. If I'm in a good mood, I come church. If I'm not in a good mood, I'm not going to come church. Oh, but they get the surf contest. You know what? I don't like Miss that, so I'm out. I'm going to go do the surf contest. That's fine. If you want to go to the surf contest, go, but then find another day to go worship the Lord with the body of Christ. Little Lonnie has a Saturday night service. But you have to get some kind of rhythm in your life where you know that there is a day that I am going to designate unto the Lord. Now, every day belongs to the Lord. 
But there is power in coming together on a single given day with all of God's people to honor him, to glorify him, to thank him, right? And that's what we want to contend for in order that you are not sleep deprived. You physically need to sleep and you physically need to honor the Sabbath day of rest, okay? So I said that the Sabbath rest was a foreshadowing of a coming age of rest. So write in your notes number two, to find rest in a full life, remember to observe the Sabbath rest and number two, enter into the believer's rest. Turn to your neighbor and say, there is a believer's rest. Okay. John chapter 19, verses 28 and 30 says this. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. Say, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Okay, so this is the last moments of Jesus on the planet Earth when he is crucified, he is nailed to the cross, he is hanging on the cross, and he's telling the Lord, forgive them for they don't know what they do. He took the sins of all of the world upon himself, and he died as the perfect sacrifice for everybody. And he says, I'm thirsty. He gets a drink, and he says, I, it's finished. And then he takes his last breath, and he dies. And we know the end of the story. On the third day, he rose again in victory. Hallelujah. But the point here that I want you to see is that his work was finished. Just like God created the heavens and the earth and all of mankind, his work was finished. He rested on the seventh day. Jesus had been ministering for three years on the planet. He goes to the ultimate end of his work, which was the cross at Calvary. He dies a sinner's death for the salvation of mankind, and he says, it's finished. All of his work is now done, and it's finished. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's finished. Once he says, it is finished, he enters into his rest for eternity. Okay? Now you and I have an opportunity to enter into that same rest. Remember Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 was Jesus' promises to, to you and I. It said, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. What kind of rest is God, Jesus, going to give you? Jesus is going to give you the believer's rest, the rest that is for eternity, meaning everything is finished. Everything is finished. Now enter into your rest. That is his promise, that if you come to him, that is the rest that he's going to give you. Okay, write into your notes, spiritual rest through Jesus Christ remains. It is not like a physical rest. Physically, you rest, you wake up, but you got to rest again. You got to go back to sleep again, right? Right? The kind of rest that Jesus wants to offer us is a rest that remains. It's a rest that is available 24-7. Okay? What is this kind of rest? This is the kind of rest that realizes that God Almighty has me in the palm of his hands. Why am I worried? This is the kind of rest that says, I don't know what I'm going to eat tomorrow, but the word of God tells you that even the birds don't worry about that. Why are you worrying about that? You're my son. You're my daughter. Don't you think I have the provision to provide for you? It's the kind of rest that we can know that like Elijah, if I go to sleep, God can supernaturally give me some food to eat. It's the kind of rest that is, takes away every anxious thought. It's the kind of rest that takes away all of your despair. It's the kind of rest that takes away all of your fear. It's the kind of rest that says, I solely and fully am under the authority of Jesus. Who can be and what can be against me? 
It is that kind of rest. It is that kind of assurance. It is the kind of rest that knows that no matter what I've done wrong, it is well with my soul because Jesus paid the ultimate price for my soul and I now will enter into eternity with him no matter what I've done, no matter what I'm going to do. By faith, I have entered into the believer's rest. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11, it tells us, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. What rest? The believer's rest. So that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. Okay, I'm going to unpack that for you. If we go to Hebrews chapter 4, in verse 1, it says, God's promise of entering his rest still stands. So we ought to tremble with fear that some of you may, might fail to experience it. The word of God tells us we should tremble with fear that there are some of you that will never enter into this rest. Verse 2, it says, For this good news that God has prepared this rest has been announced to us just as it was to them. Who's them? He's talking about the Hebrew people. This rest was offered to them, and many of them denied this rest. The Israelites wandered around in the wilderness, and God was so frustrated with their disobedience that he said, you know what? I'm going to let you keep wandering around until you just all die. I'll wait for the next generation. I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but I don't want God to say that about us. He's just going to wait for that generation over there in children's church. We want to be a generation that hears God say, come unto me and I'll give you rest. And we're running to him, being the first in line, saying, yes, I want that kind of rest. No matter what it takes, I want that kind of rest. Can I get an amen? So for this good news that God has prepared this rest has been announced to us just as it was to them, but it did, did them no good because they didn't share the faith of those who listened to God. Okay? So how do we enter into the believer's rest? Well, number one, you come to Jesus by faith. I know that sounds crazy. I know that even sounds too simple. <laughs> like, that's all I got to do? Yes. Okay? Verse 3 in Hebrew says, For only we who believe can enter his rest. Only we who believe can enter his rest. So you come to Jesus by faith. And you say yes to Jesus. Yes, I want all of you. Yes, I want to be forgiven of my sins. Yes, I want you to be my savior. Yes, I want you to lord over my life. What does that mean? That means you give him permission to lead your life. When we come to Jesus by faith, that is called salvation. Turn to your neighbor and say salvation. But the second part of that scripture in Matthew says, take my yoke upon you. Take my yoke upon you. So we enter into the believer's rest by coming to Jesus by faith. Then we're supposed to take his yoke upon us. Okay, well, that's a fancy religious word. What is yoke? For years, I'm like, what the heck does that mean, yoke? <laughs> well, I have a picture for you. Next slide, this is a yoke. Okay, that is a yoke. And if you're wondering what the heck that is, basically the next picture will show you what that is. This is what they put on animals to make them pull together in, in farming. Okay? So I, I think this is a brilliant picture of what does it mean to be yoked to Jesus. Just imagine the cow on the right looks more muscular and bigger, yeah? That's Jesus. And you're the cow on the left, kind of a little bit smaller, 
not as strong. Now, the way this works is Jesus is going to pull to the right. You're yoked to him. Do you think you can go left? No, you can't go left. If you're truly yoked to Jesus, you're connected to him. Like, it's, a, it's on your neck. If he moves right, you move right. If he moves left, you move left. If he moves forward, you move forward. If he doesn't move, you don't move either. Amen. How many of us have tried to get ahead of God so many times only to fall flat on our face? We weren't yoked to Jesus. We were running our own race. But you know the beautiful thing about this image? When you're yoked to Jesus and he's telling you what to do all the time, it is so restful. <laughs> you don't need to struggle anymore. You don't need to turmoil. Like, oh, should I do this? Should I do that? I don't know if I should do this. You got all this worry, all this anxiety, all this frustration. It's just be still. Listen for God. If he doesn't answer you, wait. <laughs> Pastor, I'm asking God, but he's not answering me. And then you get yourself all anxious again and anxiety and frustrated and you're mad and you're angry and then you're mad at him because he's not answering. Just take on his yoke. He didn't start walking. Just wait. Just sit in it. Wherever he has you, sit in that. And sometimes that's the hardest thing for us to do. We want to fix everything in our own power. We want to answer everything in our own power. We want to strive because we were taught from a very young age how to be successful, how to go and make it for ourselves. Well, if I do A, B, C, and D, then I can get all of this. And we never once go, God, what do you want for me? What will you give me? Every day, are we waking up? And I'm, I'm preaching to myself too. I had to do that just this morning. And I'm wondering, God, it, did you make me go through this because I needed an example to preach again? Like, I, I really wish I didn't have to be so experiential because it kind of just sucks. Um, but since yesterday, I was having all kinds of pain and like cramping and like, like it would double me over. I would break out into sweats. And I'm like, what in the world is going on with me? Like, God, I, I couldn't give to preparing my message because I just was in pain all day. And this morning I woke up, I'm like, oh, gosh, Glenn, it still hurts. Um, he's like, and Glenn, the, the help, not, he is, well, you could do all these. He's telling me all these things that I need to do, like, oh, let's drink tea, let's do this, let's do that, let's do this. And I'm like going, oh, man. And then, you know, Cindy notices, she prays for me. And then, you know, Kurt, obviously, I mean, Creighton notices, he walks over, he's praying for me. I mean, I couldn't even stand up and worship. For those of you that know me, that ain't normal. I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, I'm going to fall over. And I'm crying out to God, like, I need you. <laughs> I need to find some rest for this physical pain here. How am I going to preach the word of God? How, I cannot do what you're asking me to do. And he's like, find rest in me. You know, Kurt comes and he prays for me. He said, Pastor Teresa, I just see you like Jesus is going and you're just grabbing onto him. I said, Kurt, that is the story of my life. <laughs> just trying to grab onto Jesus. You know? But he says to go, and I just, okay, it's time to go. And I trust that whatever stomach issue I have will subside. I have not had a pain since I've been up here. Does that mean I won't have a pain when I get back down? I hope not. I hope the lesson is over. But, you know, if, it, if it's not over and I do physically need to rest and I have an illness or whatever, then, you know, I'm sure my husband will hook me up and give me all kinds of teas to drink and whatever. You know what I mean? But in this moment... I am yoked to Jesus, okay? We call that subjection. People don't like that word. You are subjected to him. He is your king. You are his subject. What does that mean? As your king, he says do. As the subject, you do. Back in the monarchy day, if you didn't do what the king said, you was mucky. Palm, dead, right? And our example of that is we may not be dead like in the sense of I'm going to kill you dead. But brothers and sisters, if you don't come under subjection to Jesus Christ, you walk around as a living dead person. You are not experiencing the fullness of his life when you do not come under subjection to the king. 
And that is an area that I think believers struggle with. They just want to, they want to love Jesus. They want to accept the free gift of salvation and you are saved. But if you don't live under subjection, you're not going to live with the abundance of life that he had planned for you. You will have eternal life. But don't you want abundance of life right now and eternal life? Or do you want to walk around constantly feeling sleep deprived? Not rested. And as I was thinking about this, I was thinking, wow, Lord, some of us need to go to sleep, not just physically. We need to sleep, yeah. We're sleep deprived. But some of us are sleep deprived because we need to go to sleep on our thoughts. We need to go to sleep on our emotions that are trying to rule us. We need to go to sleep on the anxiety. We need to go to sleep on trying to make our lives happen on our own power. We need to go to sleep and we need to just let Jesus take that wheel and drive us. We need to go to sleep and we need to yoke ourselves to Jesus and where he tugs we go. It is effortless in just following him. It's a lot of work when we try to lead. Amen? Okay, how do we enter the believer's rest? Well, you come to him by faith, you take his yoke, and then you continue to learn from him. That's living a life of submission and surrender. How are you going to learn from him? Daily coming into his word. The word of God in Psalm chapter 95 verse 2 and in Psalm chapter 100 verse 4, it says we enter into God's courts, we enter into God's presence with thanksgiving. So I oftentimes have people ask me, Pastor Teresa, why in worship do we always start with a fast praise thanksgiving song? Well, because the word of God tells us that we enter into his courts with thanksgiving. So we want to come into God's presence thanking him. We don't want to come into his presence begging him to do everything we need to do. Come into his presence thanking him first. And I thought how appropriate that this message comes during the month of November when we're getting ready to, to celebrate Thanksgiving. And this is how you don't have to labor when you in, enter into the believer's constant state of rest. I already told you I had the message notes, but I didn't totally flesh it out. But I trusted that God was going to work it through me. Well, he actually gave me another element for my message this morning. I didn't, wasn't even looking for it. I'm like, oh, Don, that totally fits my message. Oh, man, hallelujah, I'm giving her a high five. And God had given her a revelation. Okay, God is in control of everything. He can work it all out. We just need to get out of his way. God had given Dawn a revelation of something that she had done with her family that we're going to do together as a family of God. They're going to have um, some, some sticks or branches, and we're going to create a Thanksgiving tree. And so starting next week, you can come to church, and you can get a paper leaf, and you're going to write on this paper leaf what you're thankful for, and you're going to hang it on the tree. And every week we're going to have a Thanksgiving tree. You can keep adding to it. By the time we hit Thanksgiving and the end of this month, we should have a full tree. Can I get an amen? And, and it's just a way for us to practice coming into his presence with thanksgiving. Sometimes we come into God's presence on Sunday because we need something. No, just come into his presence with thanksgiving. He'll work out the needs. He knows what you need. Just come into his presence with thanksgiving and let him do the rest. Amen? And I think that this leads to our last point, number three. So to find rest in a full life, you observe the Sabbath rest, you enter into the believer's rest, and finally you cast your cares on the Lord. And that comes from Psalm 52, verse 22. It says, cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. You are righteous, or you are made right with God through faith in Jesus Christ. There is no more working. There is no more working for salvation. There is no more working for rest. We are given this rest. We are given this gift of salvation through grace. We don't have to earn it, and we don't have to work for it. And that's hard for us to understand because we've been taught our whole lives that you have to work for anything you get. There's no free lunch here. you got to work for whatever you're going to get. How many of you have heard that before? That's what we're, we're trained to think. So then you come to God and he says, you can't, to work for this gift is an insult to my son. You cannot work for what I'm going to give you. 
You can only get this by coming to my son by faith because he did all the work. He will receive all the glory. He will receive all the honor. What you receive is salvation. What you receive is a believer's rest. Amen? But working is done. And we tend as believers, as non-believers, we just want to work, 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 work. And God is saying, if you keep laboring and trying to work for this rest that I've already given you, then what you're telling me is the work that my son did on the cross and said was finished wasn't good enough. Have you ever been around people where you'll clean, you'll clean the house and then they'll go re-clean it because your clean wasn't good enough? I'm guilty of this. I'm so guilty of this. I'm learning though. Glenn is like trying to serve and he'll, he'll go and he'll clean the kitchen. And his standard of cleaning the kitchen ain't my standard of cleaning the kitchen. <laughs> his clean is just make sure there's nothing in the sink. My clean is make sure the dishes are in the dish rack nicely, not just falling all over the place. And if it doesn't fit, guess what? They invented things like a towel. Dry some off and put them away. <laughs> then the final step is wipe all the counters down. And while you're at it, sweep the floor. <laughs> That's my clean. Glenn's clean is kind of just a tidy. <laughs> but I would go in there and clean up after him. And then he'd be like, fine, you do it then. So if your husband doesn't clean the kitchen, maybe you need to check yourself. Are you, are you micromanaging his cleaning? <laughs> Don't do that, because he'll stop cleaning. Okay? <laughs> Just be happy he did something. Amen? <laughs> well, we can do the same thing to Jesus. Okay? I know I'm punching fun at it, but he got up on the cross, he died, and he said it was finished, and now you think you've got to clean yourself up. Like his clean wasn't enough. Come on now. <laughs> Preaching myself happy. Okay, there is no more work. When Jesus said it was finished, it was really finished. No more lifting, no more laboring. Just come into his rest. Rest from trying to get yourself saved. Rest from trying to make yourself all perfect and pretty. Put on these masks, try to be all perfect and mess. There is nobody perfect. If you're in our church and you have a little quirky thing about you, hallelujah, praise the Lord, you fit right here. We all have it. And we get to practice God's unfailing love every day. The same love he expressed to us on the cross, we get to express to each other. And how do we do that? We do that by accepting all the quirkiness of every person that comes through these doors. Because none of us is perfect. Can I get an amen? And all of us can enter this amazing rest. But we have to cast our cares on him. We come unto him with praise and thanksgiving. We've, re we've received the salvation. Once you've entered into his, the believer's rest, you have to walk in that rest. Salvation happens in a moment, but you've got to live out your salvation from day to day. You can get saved today and tomorrow be back to your worrying old self. So what are you going to do tomorrow? How do you keep walking in that rest that you received today? Well, wake up and start thanking him again that he woke you up. Thank him that you have the ability to breathe. Thank him that you could walk to the bathroom. Thank you that you can go to the bathroom by yourself. Thank him that you have two hands. Thank him that there's food in your refrigerator. I don't know. Thank him for all kinds of things. Enter into his presence. Then you can cast your cares on him. You know, Lord, I have a big day ahead of me. I've been struggling at work. I have a boss that's a pill. I don't know how to unconditionally love this person. Lord, I have a mountain heap of bills that need to get paid, but I'm putting my faith and my trust in you that you are Jehovah Jireh. You are my provider. You will find a way to pay the bills. You cast those onto the Lord, and you stay yoked to him knowing that if he says go right, I'm going right. If he says go left, I'm going left. Amen? And how do we do that? By learning at his feet. You read the word of God. You put on the mind of Christ. 
You get rid of your own mind, your own thoughts, because 99.9% .9 of our battle is our own thoughts that the enemy is trying to manipulate. But if we can get rid of that clutter and just hear the mind of God, which we have been given, then we'll be all right. All will be well with our soul. Can I get an amen? So I want to encourage you this morning that if you feel sleep deprived, whether it is you need to sleep physically or maybe you need to find sleep and rest spiritually, coming unto Jesus is the answer. Would you stand with me as we close in prayer? With every eye closed and every head bowed, if you are here this morning and you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ to find rest for your souls, with every eye closed and every head bowed, would you raise your hand? I would like to pray for you. And maybe you're here this morning and you've put your faith in Jesus. You know who Jesus is. You know what he did for you on the cross. And yet you don't experience the believer's rest every day. You are constantly struggling in turmoil and stress and anxiety. And you want to find rest in Christ alone. Would you raise your hand? I want to pray for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Would you just repeat this prayer after me? Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for the believer's rest. I believe that when Jesus said it was finished, it truly was finished. Forgive me for trying to do more work by faith. I want to enter into the believer's rest and stay there. In this moment, I cast all of my cares, all of my worries, all of my anxiety on you. I choose to be yoked to you that you would lead me and guide me every day of my life so that I would have your perfect and complete peace lacking in nothing. Help me to control my thoughts so that I would have only your thoughts, O oh Lord, and trust in you alone. For it is in Christ alone that I find rest. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Would you give the Lord a hand clap? Hallelujah. If God spoke to you, would you let us know about that on the communication card? And I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, we all fall subject to trying to work things out in our flesh again. It's a natural, sinful thing we do. So when you get to that place where you feel so sleep deprived again, reach out. Don't allow for the enemy to get you isolated. Because sometimes we need other believers to help us enter into that place of rest. Amen. So be encouraged in the Lord that we're all learning this together to find rest in him every single moment of every day. Amen.